Genesis chapter 13. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate you being with us online. We love you and we thank God for you. It's a new chapter in the book of Genesis. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him. Now, who was Lot? It was his nephew. It was his brother's son. And why was Lot with him? Why was Lot with him? Right, his dad died. So, Lot is now... And so, practically, Abraham, Abram, at this time, he's not Abraham yet, he's raising Lot. He's overseeing his nephew. He's taking him under his wing, as it were. And we also know that Lot, Lot is not Abram's son. Abram doesn't have a son yet. He's not, he doesn't have Ishmael yet. He doesn't have Isaac. And so you can sort of see why Lot fits into this family so well. Uh, Lot is a man who doesn't have a father. Abraham is a man who doesn't have a son. So God puts them together like that. Amen. But things happen. Things happen. And this is not really the lesson for tonight. But Genesis 13 is a illustration, and there's multitudes of them in the Bible, of what happens when brethren disagree. What happens when brethren disagree? I used to think in my youth that denominations were evil, that we should all just throw down the denominations and all just be happy together okay why are we dividing up into these factions paul addressed that in first corinthians chapter one some say i am of apollos some say i am of paul others beat everybody well we're of christ ha 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 and um paul didn't like that as i've matured and developed ideas and doctrines, things that I believe. I'm not, and I mentioned it this morning, I'm not as bendable as I used to be. I don't change well the older I get. I get more rigid and more strict and more firm and affirmed in what I believe. And not everybody agrees with me. And there are times, because we're human, we don't all see eye to eye. We all see, we're looking through a dark glass. The Bible says we all see through a glass darkly. And we're trying to see God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, salvation. We're trying to see these things that we believe in. We're trying to read them from the Bible and understand what God is saying. But our minds are not as big as the Bible's words are. So we don't all grasp it the same way. Some people see it this way. Some people see it that way. Uh, Caleb asked me this morning, on our way in, there's two churches. I mean, literally side by side. They're in Hillsboro. <clears throat> one is an assembly of God. One is a United Methodist. I mean, you can't get more far apart than that. One is extreme left. One is extreme right, I suppose. And, uh, you know, he asked, you know, why did this, why are there two churches right next door to each other? Well, it has to do with what people believe and how they see. And if they disagree, then we find it difficult to stand with other people that we disagree with and to stay with them. And so that's what happens here in Genesis 13. And the, the short of it is that they separated. We know this happens in this chapter. That Lot and Abram separated one from another. And there's multiple examples in the Bible. I'll probably talk about that next Sunday night. But anyway, let's continue reading this and we'll go to prayer. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle. Wow, think about that. God had blessed him. There's no doubt about it. And it's not a sin, to have the wealth of the world, it is not a sin to have that. It is a sin. 
when you put it first in your heart, when, when the love of money stands between you and God, it is a sin and it is the root of all evil. There's no doubt in my mind about it. But Abram wasn't seeking riches. He was seeking God. He was seeking grace. And God just happened to bless him. God blesses other people with poverty. And you say, well, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, it does. Some people don't do well with money. If they had a million dollars, is it possible? Some people could live, if, if they were given a million dollars, how old are you, Matthew? Yes, 24. 24, yeah, I was going to say that. So at 24, if you were given a million dollars to put in the bank, it's your money, tax-free, could you live on that the rest of your life? Yeah, no, you probably won't earn a million dollars in your life, okay? So, but some people, they'd be gone out of that money in a year or less. The prodigal son probably did it, okay? So it just depends. God does bless some people with poverty because those are the people who rely on God literally for everything. And God awakened me to this my first trip to Kenya. And a lot of healing services take place over there. Why? Because they can't afford the hospital. Hospitals will not take you unless you have the money in your hand to pay the bill. They will let you literally die on the doorstep before coming in and when the, they will not treat you that's just the way it is so they have to rely upon the lord to heal them so nothing wrong with it but anyway abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold and he went on his journeys from the south even to bethel and it's interesting moses is writing this as a history and bethel has not been named bethel yet because bethel is named bethel bethel by who jacob so Jacob hasn't even been born yet, neither is Isaac. So, but between Bethel and Hai, which I believe is Ai, that's the, the city. Uh, you have the king of Ai. Am I, am I, reading, am I remembering that right? That um, the Israeli, uh, Joshua led the Israelites in battle against at Ai and they got their tails kicked. Because Achan had sinned in stealing something out of Jericho. But anyway, that's the place. Under the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Let's go to prayer. Father, we ask your blessings. And I pray, dear God, that you would guide my thoughts. And Lord, just keep me in line with the scriptures and with my notes. But Father, Lord, you lead. You take over. And Lord, you just work through me and teach your people what you want them to know, what you want them to hear. This book is yours, my life is yours, this church is yours, and the cattle on a thousand hill is yours. Everything belongs to you, and uh, we believe that you are sovereign in everything. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just guide my thoughts, guide the teaching tonight, open up our eyes. Father, thank you for a marvelous book, a wonderful book to read from, to memorize, to think on, to live by. There's no greater book than the book we open up tonight. We ask Jesus to come and open it up in our presence for our understanding. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Uh, the number 13, let, let me deal with that first before we get into the rest of the chapter. The number 13, have you ever been in a building that did not have a 13th floor? No, you haven't. <laughs> huh? Mm. Have you? Okay. A building higher than, let's say, 14 floors. Have you ever been in a building that didn't have a 13 on the elevator button? Okay. Why is that? Superstition. 13 supposedly an unlucky number. We, of course, don't. I don't believe in luck, okay? Buddhists do, Chinese people do, I guess. They believe in luck. And their version of luck really isn't chance. 
it has more to do with spirits than it does anything. When uh, someone of an Asian persuasion wishes you luck, they're wishing that the gods would be favorable to you, is how they understand it. Um, but I don't, I don't believe in luck and I don't believe in un, being unlucky or lucky. I believe in be, you're either blessed or you're cursed one way or the other. The things that we have, if things turn out favorable in, in our estate, then it's a blessing from God. It didn't just happen by chance, but some people see the number 13 as an unlucky number, or some people see it as a lucky number. What does the number 13 actually represent? Well, look in your look in Genesis 13 here. And I want you to look at verse 13. Okay? So 13, 13. And it says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. 13 words exactly. So we're in the 13th chapter the 13th verse and we have 13 words that tell us what that number has to do with what it represents what it means god is a god of order math is the universal language because two plus two is still four in japan and kenya and russia and the north pole and the south pole everywhere you go two plus two is four there's no changing that there's no way around it. Numbers are infinite. God is infinite. Numbers, there's no end to numbers. There's no beginning of numbers. They just keep on going past, present, future. The numbers always indicate the order of God. And God does things in a divine order, I believe. When the, to me, the one of the greatest studies I personally have ever done, studying the numbers of the Bible. To me, it's beautiful. It's how God is. He's a very orderly God. He is, he is not chaotic in any way. When you have chaos and frenzy and disorder, you know there's an evil spirit around. When you have order, you know you don't have to ask if God is around. God, and I've seen it multiple times. What, what led me to prayer one night in Kenya when I was so disturbed by devils, I mean, they were climbing all over me, was one of the preachers I was talking to about my plan to leave Kenya and get back to the, to the States, was that pastor said, this is, this is so confusing. I don't like any of this. And when he said the word confusion, the Holy Ghost said, Mike, you understand what this is now? Yes. And there was, I mean, it was a, a confusion disorder, chaotic spirit all over me, just tearing my thoughts to shreds. And I went and prayed and God delivered me from that. And boy, what a blessing that was. But I believe God is a God of order. And that's why, I mean, I look at something like this and what I've just given you is a fact. This is chapter 13. This is verse 13. And you can count them yourself. They're exactly 13 words. Now, I didn't put it that way. I didn't make it that way. It's been that way for 400 years plus 410 years now. And it is the way it is. I believe the Bible is in order. And I believe the order shows us the very nature and character of who God is. So the number 13, Revelation 17, 5. We have this woman in the Bible. And I would say it would be unlucky for you to get involved with her. I would say that, but I won't. Okay. Uh, upon her forehead was a name written. Mystery. Babylon the Great. The mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I just, I counted those words. They're, they just stick out on the page because they're all caps. Mystery Babylon the Great. The mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Exactly 13 words. So I wanted to know what this number 13 really represented. I consulted a couple of books I had at the time and I read them and to see what they said the number 13 represented and so on. But I, I said, God, I want to know it from the Bible. What is, what is that? What does it represent? What does it mean? It took a while.
for this one to set in. We know a little bit about Babylon, her spirit. She is a feminine spirit. She is a harlot spirit. She goes by many names across history and across the world. Gaia, Diana, Ashtaroth. Those are the Diana and Ashtaroth are the two names out of the Bible. Isis is another one. And there's a multitude of female divinities that have existed throughout history and so on. I'm not going to get into all that. But think of a harlot, not too much, but just think of what they provide. They provide, quote unquote, love. Love. But not true love. It is a temporary, very fleshly lust is what it is. And she will provide it. But she never gives it away. Never, never, never does she do that. Babylon is noted as the mistress of witchcrafts. So in studying Wicca, I found out that they have 13 laws. 13 principles that guide them. Why did they pick that particular number? Okay. Probably, I believe, because the spirit behind it is mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. The number 13 pops up in Wicca, pops up in secret societies and so on. Babylon, if you go to Genesis 10, Babylon was built by Nimrod. And when you count the lineage from Adam down to Nimrod, Nim Nimrod is 13th. He's the 13th in line. And does that matter? Well, Jude mentioned that Enoch was seventh from Adam. Now, why did he say that? Because I think it had to do with the timing of the prophecy. Because Enoch's prophecy was the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And so since Enoch was mentioned that he's the seventh from Adam, I think it has to do with the timing, the seventh day of the prophecy. All right. Uh, Genesis 10, 8. Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord and the beginning of his kingdom. Notice this. Here's another number. Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kauna. Four. He is a prototype, a prophecy of the fourth kingdom mentioned in the book of Daniel. Chapter uh, 2. Daniel chapter 7. The four great beasts that Daniel sees rise up out of the sea and so on. Revelation 13 comes to mind, but he is the king of Babylon and he just happens to be the 13th in line from Adam. I didn't do that. You didn't do that. Nimrod certainly didn't do it. God did it. God ordered and ordained that this man would be born in the, the 13th in line from Adam to, to lay out a, his plan for us to show us to give us wisdom wisdom comes by counting revelation 13 here is wisdom let him that hath understanding count the number of the beasts it says in first samuel chapter 13 verse 13 samuel said to saul thou hast done foolishly thou hast not kept the commandment of the lord thy god which he commanded thee for now would the lord have established thy kingdom upon israel forever and i'll tell you what i forgot to do I told you that Genesis 13, 13 had 13 words. Did I read it? But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. I think I did read it, but I didn't expand on it. The idea is that 13 on that particular side of it represents rebellion. You'll see, um, if you look over in Genesis 14... Let's see here. In verse 4, 12 years they served Kedor Laomer, and in the 13th year they rebelled. It's right there. Okay? So the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. That's rebellion. And since Babylon is the mistress of witchcrafts, the Bible says, uh, her number is 13. And the definition of that number has to do with rebellion. It has to do with 
false love versus true love. And I'll explain that. Of course, 1 Samuel 13, 13, this is Saul's sin. What did he do? He rejected the word of the Lord. Samuel laid out a clear commandment for him and Saul rejected it. And it's mentioned in that 13th verse in the 13th chapter. So in 1 Samuel 15, 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. The two of them go together. Remember, I was talking about Jezebel. There's always going to be a Jezebel. There is always going to be a Jezebel in your life, in churches, in our country. There is a Jezebel spirit, a mystery Babylon type spirit, a harlot spirit that will trade, trade off one thing for another. Okay. Why do most politicians, why haven't our politicians voted in term limits for Congress? Huh? Takes away their money. Exactly. But not from the salary that they pay them. From the backdoor deals that are made. Why are all these big politicians have these 501c3 charitable organizations? These two guys testified before Congress. They did an audit of the Clinton Foundation. And they said the Clintons had their hand in the cookie jar into the billions of dollars. They were spending money that was supposed to go to these people in Haiti. They were spending that on their lavish lifestyle and going to Epstein Island. Wickedness. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And, and in this case, it cost Saul his soul. That's hard to say. It cost Saul his soul. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Deuteronomy 13, 13. Notice what it says. Certain men, the children of Belial. Who's Belial? He's the devil. Children, you'll find this phrase in the Bible. Children of Belial, sons of Belial, daughter of Belial. Belial is Satan. It's another word for him. Beelzebub, Lucifer, the dragon, the old devil, the serpent. Certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. That's rebellion. And what do these gods always require? When you pray to these, any of these gods, what must you do? You must sacrifice something. You must offer them something that is very precious to you. I cannot fathom in my mind throwing my baby child into a burning fire for a God. I cannot, I cannot fathom that. That has to be a spirit takes a person over. It has to be. Jeremiah 13, 13. Then shalt thou say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will fill all the inhabitants of this land, even the kings that sit upon David's throne, and the priests and the prophets, and all the inhabitants with, of Jerusalem with drunkenness. If you go back to Revelation 17, you'll notice that Babylon, I always, I always picture as a martini glass in one hand and a cigarette in the other. You'll notice in verse, I don't know if I have this in my notes, no. Verse 6, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. She holds in her hand a golden cup full of filthiness and abominations. It's full of it. Uh, by the way, after this service, I uh, have not had a chance to do so yet, but I'm going to record the next Watchman broadcast and it will deal with the abomination of desolation. What sin is it that is so great and so detestable in God's eyes that he literally leaves, makes him go away so that his presence is no longer there? Okay, what is it? Daniel's a sealed book in my eyes, in my view, 
There's many things in Daniel that I just do not understand. I await Christ unsealing it when he gets ready to. But there are some things that God said is an abomination and it, that it will cause desolation. Desolation is like a wilderness. Nobody lives there. Okay. Uh, but anyway, that's mystery Babylon. She is a drunkard. She is the spirit behind why people get drunk. Um, the liquor industry, the drug industry. And when I say the drug industry, I'm referring to mind altering drugs, not aspirin, Tylenol, heart medicine, high blood pressure medicine, things like that. Those are beneficial to us and do not alter our minds. I'm talking about things like marijuana, LSD, cocaine, methamphetamine, things like that, that alter the rational thinking of the mind. She is the spirit behind all of that. Okay. She is a, like I said, she is a spirit of witchcraft. She is a spirit of rebellion. John 13, 21. In this particular chapter, Jesus says exactly, count them. Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. 13, exactly. And who was he talking about? The man, Judas, the, who is the only other person in the Bible who is ever called son of perdition. Yes, he's the only one that was ever called that other than the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2. But that's in John chapter 13. And John 13 is dealing with, barely, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And that issue of rebellion against Jesus Christ. What spirit was in him? Babylon. Mark, we know that Satan literally entered into him. By the way, Jezebel is Babylon. Name some other women in the Bible that you think fit the stereotype of Babylon. Huh? Herodias? Uh-huh. And her, yeah, and her Jezebel daughter. Mm -hmm. Deli Delilah. That's a sweet name, isn't it? What's your name, darling? Delilah. Ooh, darling. She had him. Give me another one. Wicked woman in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. She's in bondage with her child. Okay. Uh, he mentioned Hagar. Anybody else? Got any? Oh, Potiphar's wife. Yeah, Potiphar's wife. Oh, yeah. She's Jezebel. She is. Okay. She's a harlot. Okay. Look at Mark chapter 7. Turn there. Mark chapter 7. So are we. So are we. All of us have it in us to be a Jezebel. A spirit of whoredoms. All of us have it in us. Uh, somebody mentioned Atalia from the Bible. Uh, that's a good one. Mark chapter seven. Italia. I don't, I don't think she was. He asked what she's, was she Jezebel's sister? No, I don't, I don't think so. She was a, she was the wicked queen, I think. Right. Anyway, Mark chapter seven, verse 20. Cause they, they caught the disciples eating without washing their hands. Well, that's 99.9% .9 of the time when I eat. Okay. And they said, that's, that's, that's against the law. It's forbidden to do that. They said, they accused them then of being defiled because they had eaten with unwashed hands and Jesus corrected them. Said, Your doctrine is not right. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, 
That means inside of each one of us, out of the heart of men. And think about what the heart of wicked man has done in the 6,000 years of his existence on this earth. Wicked, abominable things. Detestable things to other people. Evil things. And these, these things that proceed out of the heart of men, they go against the two laws that Jesus came to give us. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. Evil thoughts. I could stop right there and say, let's repent of that one. Evil thoughts. Everybody has them. Everybody does. And some people, you know they have them because it comes out of their mouth. What they think is never silent. They've never had a silent thought in their life. Evil thoughts. That comes out of you. What you think you tend to become. Adulteries. They come out of the heart of man. Fornications, murders, a murder generally premeditated, taking someone's life who is innocent. I'm not talking about shooting a guy who's trying to assault your wife. I'm just talking about going to go kill somebody just because. Murders, thefts. Stealing of somebody else's property. And where does theft begin? Theft begins with covetousness. You either want what your neighbor has or you want drugs. So you're going to steal what your neighbor has to get money to get drugs. But it all starts with covetousness. Okay? And he mentioned that right after that. Thefts, covetousness, wickedness. Deceit, lies, lies come out of the heart of man. Lasciviousness, telling dirty jokes all the time, an evil eye, blasphemy, that comes out of the heart of man. Pride comes out of the heart of man. Pride's a terrible, terrible sin. Pride is, I would say, one of the worst. Just in my opinion. God can deal with somebody, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. God can deal with them, convict them. They will repent. Pride keeps us from repenting. Pride says, I'll not repent. I'll not kneel. I'll not submit. Pride runs deep in some people's lives. Foolishness. There's 13 things here. Evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Thirteen things here. Okay? And all of these deal with rebellion and sins against our neighbor. Now, uh, is it wrong to mow your neighbor's grass? No. Not necessarily. Uh, it's not a sin to do that, but does that mean that you love him because you mowed his grass? Not necessarily. You may want to keep bringing it up. Hey, I mowed your grass. Why don't you do this for me? That's not love. That's an exchange. I did this. Now you, now you owe me. Now you give me this. Okay? That's Babylon. All those things in Revelation 18, all the things, merchandise is never free. Merchandise is always for sale. The only thing that's free is the grace of God. Okay? I would say everything else has some price attached to it somehow, some way. The heroin dealer who takes, who sends guys to schools to give 
the first dose out to kids at school. The first one's free. But the second one is going to cost them the rest of their life. Okay? And all of these things violate love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. All of these do in one way or the other. They violate that idea of pure, unadulterated love. So, Revelation 13, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. In Revelation 13, we see the, the fruition of what man's sin and rebellion is all about. We have the beast with seven heads and ten horns in verse 1. And then verse 11, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. And notice in verse 13. In verse 13 it says, and he doeth, I, there's not, there's more than 13 words here, so. And he doeth great, I counted. So he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. That's in verse 13. Well, if you go to Deuteronomy 13, there's a connection to that verse, to that exact verse. Deuteronomy 13 deals with a false prophet who does signs and wonders. Isn't that something? How God connected them together by that number. Deuteronomy 13, 1, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass where he spake unto thee, saying, let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. You better be really careful what you're watching, what you're believing from the internet and from the television. You better be really, really careful about what you're buying into. The deceivers are on the left wing and the right wing. They're coming from all around us, deceiving mankind, deceiving people, lying through their teeth, saying, oh, I had a vision. God showed me this and this is going to happen. This and this is going to happen. And I fell into that many, many, many years ago. And God delivered me from it. Mike, you want dreams and visions? Read, read, read Joseph's, read Pharaoh's, read Nebuchadnezzar's dream. I'll give you all kinds of visions and dreams right here in the book. Amen. And notice in Acts 13, it's when Paul, Saul dealt with, guess who? A false prophet. When they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer. Sorcery and Wicca, witchcraft are one and the same. A false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus. You know what that word means? Bar Jesus? You know what it means? Huh? Son of Jesus. Or out of or from Jesus. It's the equivalent to the... Is it... Which is Scottish and Irish? I forget. O'Malley is Scottish. And McCoy is Irish. Mac means son of... In Ireland and in Scotland, O, O Harver or O whoever means son of. He came out of. And it's the same way in, in Hebrew. The bar means came out of Jesus or from Jesus or the son of Jesus, something like that. But that's interesting that his name is Bar Jesus. And here in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul warned us about another Jesus, a false prophet. Now, that's the, evil, that's the evil side of the number. That's the left-hand part of the number. On the good side, you have 12 tribes, and God is with them. For 40 years, He never left them. Always was in their midst with them. 12 tribes plus God, 13. That's the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. The New Testament, similar. Jesus and 12 apostles, 12 disciples. And Ephesians 2.20 are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That's 13. So when it comes to love and the truth, true love, genuine love, Someone you might think loves you, 
but you find out that they're using you. Which means that they are showing you favor, but it's going to cost you something. You're going to have to compensate them for the favor that they have shown you. The kindness, the gentleness. And it's not a gift. You have to do it. It's a pay. You have to pay for it. Or they won't give it to you. Okay? Should a man be paid when he doesn't work? Not really. There are some exceptions. But the rule is, if you don't work, you don't eat. You don't get paid. Okay? So, John, there's a reason why Boeing is not sending you a check every week for $2,000. Now, how did I know that? How did I know that John isn't getting a check from Boeing every week for $2,000? You don't work there. Okay? So, I mean, that's just how the world works. And when it comes to love, if you have to compensate or pay a price for it, it's not real love. It's not. It's not genuine, true love. So turn to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Gary, I have seen people on YouTube videos destroy this verse in, in a church setting. Literally destroy that verse by saying he only died for the elect. He only died for the people who deserved it. Literally destroy that verse. That is not what it says. And then you can give me a Greek lesson if you want to. Well, in the original Greek, it, it lays it out that, that that's it's that way. And it can't be translated. You, well, if it can't be translated, then it ain't true. God gave his son, and I said it this morning, if today every... All 7.2 billion people on this planet right now bowed their knee to Jesus Christ and confessed their sins. He would forgive every single one of them. In the greatest revival the earth has ever seen. Amen. I would be out of a job as of that point. Okay. And gladly out of a job. But he gave his son without any. What can you pay God? What can you give to God that he wants that he doesn't have already? Nothing. There's nothing. We sing that song. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. We bring no price, no payment, no money, no substance, no merchandise, nothing. You say, well, well we give our souls. It was his. He created it. He is the owner of everything. There is nothing you can give to God. So when he sent his only begotten son, he did so out of pure, true love. So turn to 1 Corinthians 13. And you see, you see the opposites. Why does a harlot... This really happened. Matthew, I don't know if I ever told you this story. That buddy of mine, I got his picture, Craig Shaw. I sang in a college male quartet group, 1985, and we traveled the country. And I did it because we were going to travel the country. I'm going, I'm going to be 19 years old and I'm going to see the whole country and I'm going to get paid for it. Yeah, that's how I'm spending my summer. So I auditioned and got the part. And me and three other guys from our Bible college and one representative, we did. We toured the whole country. We ended up Times Square, New York in 1985. Now, they've cleaned it up a lot since then. But in 1985, it was pretty filthy. There was a lot of um, taverns, 
a lot of beer joints, and a lot of prostitutes everywhere. So on this tour, we find ourselves on a late Sunday night in Times Square, New York City, walking the streets. And the guy that was with us, that was his old stomping grounds. He grew up, he knew the area. So he's taking us to Times Square. We're walking around at night. We go into a a New York deli, okay, and get a sandwich. And I'm going, I ate a Subway sandwich from a New York deli. Man, I'm something. 19 years old, okay? We walk out of this deli and this woman standing there going, hi boys. And we knew what she was. She was dressed for it. And we're just going, oh my goodness. Get in the van, hurry, let's go. Let's get out of here. Okay. What was she wanting? Money. She was going to be nice to us as long as we paid her. And I'm telling you, that's not love. That is what most people substitute. Even in a marriage, it can be done that way. A husband or a wife can use one favor to get another. If I say to my wife, I love you, I do not have to have a response. Because my love for my wife is not conditioned upon her loving me. Now, it would break my heart if she didn't love me back. But my love for my wife is not conditioned on the fact that she loves me. I'm going to love her regardless. And that's the true charity. The word is right. Charity is the word. Now, the Greek where you've heard the word agape, there are three words that are translated as love from the Greek. There is philos, like it's a, like the word philosophy means you love wisdom. Okay. A philologist is someone who loves languages. They like to study language. Okay. Which means they don't like to flip burgers at McDonald's. They like to study languages. A philologist. That's a general love of something, what we like. There is eros, which is where we get the word erotic from. You can guess what that is. But then there's agape, okay? And that love, translated charity. 1 John 4, 9, And this was manifested to love God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. He sent His only begotten Son unconditionally to the world. And said, here is my present to mankind, my creation. I offer him freely to you with no expectation of return whatsoever. I just ask that you trust him and believe in him. So the phrase love of God is exactly 13 times in your Bible. Exactly. So 1 Corinthians 13 has exactly 13 verses in it. There is not 1 Corinthians 13, 14. It stops at verse 13. And it tells you in no uncertain terms. And now abideth faith. And by the way, there's not 13 words here. I think there's only 12. I counted. Now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three. But the greatest of these is not faith. And it's not hope. The greatest of these is charity. There is nothing greater that you can experience. Nothing greater in this world and in the afterlife. That you can have given to you and coming from you than pure love love to give somebody something and you expect nothing in return why are we feeding people why are we digging a well why don't we just save all that money why don't we just hold on to that and hoard that money and hang on to that and keep that why because of love what do we expect out of those people not one thing nothing we do we expect from them we don't expect favors we don't expect them to, uh, to send us a nice plaque. I appreciate the people of, of um, Samburu who held a, a big festival in our church's honor, inviting me out there for digging a well for them. I appreciated that. But I dug the well. We dug the well. All of us together, we dug the well. And we didn't have to have that. In fact, I was going to turn their invitation down. I was going to turn it down and God talked me into it 
And I'm glad I did. Because those people were lovely people. And I lo- you have to love those people. Or you'll, not do, or you'll not do for them in the right way. If I go back out there again, I will not have an expectation that th- any of those people owe us anything. We did it to show them who Jesus is. Because Jesus loves them unconditionally. Okay? So did Abram. With Lot. He loved him unconditionally, which is why he said to him what he said to him in Genesis 13. Lot, Abram had a right to say, what are you complaining about? All this stuff's mine anyway. Everything you have, I gave you. Why are you complaining? Why don't you just, why don't you just go your way then, if you, big boy? If you think you don't like it here in my house, go live somewhere else. That's not what he said. And why didn't he do it that way? Love. Pure love. Unadulterated love. Father teaches that kind of love. It is not easy for us. You know this. You came down here. You got mad at people. You see the world for how it really is. It is very, very wicked. I see people. I don't know what they've done. You see people. You know everything about them. You know everything about me. And why you love me. I have no idea. But I'm very grateful. And I don't want to ever take your love for me for granted. And just assume that it's always going to be there. Assume that I can do anything. I can despise you. I can walk away from you. And think that you'll love me. And... And take advantage of it. God, I don't want to do that. I want to love you. And I want to love others. The way you love me. And the way you love them. That's what I want. And I find it difficult at times. With certain people. To love them that way. And Father, I want to be forgiven of that. And I want to be blessed with the blessing to love people as they are, unconditionally. And to show that love by giving them of myself and anything that I have. There are people I would die for. There are people, Lord, that I would have a tough time dying for. But you died for everybody. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for dying for the people of this church, my family. God, I cannot thank you enough for dying for the sinner when he didn't deserve it. Our religion, Father, is the best. And I have no problem saying that because it has the best love of any religion any religion help us as your disciples teach us how to love people that way in jesus name and all of god's people said amen god bless you you're dismissed